Democratic socialism has for the last hundred years been pretty much a fringe belief, even on the left. Now open socialists are all of a sudden running for office across the United States and they are winning Democratic primaries. Today on The View, Joy Behar started an argument when she declared her support for this ideology. Here's part of it. On your tax form, I think you should start paying the amount of taxes that every socialist in this country thinks you need to. They have just given this enormous tax break to the very, very wealthy in this country. Mm -hmm. that that tax break doesn't have to be so generous to those really rich people, does it? Because if you don't give that money to them, what happens to that money? Better schools, I better think, post office, I'm sorry, better garbage pickup, better pickup. Do you think, better you think the government is so good at running things, then the post office is a Listen, great run business? One more word. The VA? Some of us do not want socialism to be normalized okay. in this country. I am an example. We Wait, can I finish will be Behar did not release her own tax return, so we could see how many deductions she took. We're awaiting that. Meanwhile, Jeff Weaver managed Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. He's the author of the book, How Bernie Won, Inside the Revolution That Is Taking Back Our Country and Where We Go From Here. Jeff Weaver joins us tonight. Jeff, thanks a lot for coming on. Hey, Tucker. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So you just did an interview um, and were asked basically, what is this creed? What is democratic socialism? And you described basically... A, a series of economic beliefs. Here's what you said. Um, people want economic security, they want health care, they want dignity in old age, they want to know that they're not going to die with nothing. All pretty reasonable sounding ideas. When I, when I listen to Demo and you know, how we pay for them is the point, but we could debate that, but those aren't bad ideas. When I hear modern Democrats talking, it is never about economics. It is about abortion. It is overwhelmingly about immigration and why we need to let people stay here, whether they're legal or not. It is nothing about an agenda of empowering the middle class economically. Why is that? Well, uh, let me tell you, Tucker, I think uh, Democrats have to start walking and chewing gum at the same time. We do have to talk about uh, the plight of marginalized communities in this uh, country who have been targeted, uh, especially by the president uh, during his administration. But we also have to talk about uh, the economic uh, needs of people in every zip code in this country. You know, wages are stagnant. Uh, people are, are anxious about their futures, about their kids' futures, about taking care of their aging parents, about affording college. Uh, and we have to talk about all of these issues, frankly. And I, and I agree with you that we oh, need to hear I mean, more conversation. On, but there's only, right, but there's only so much time in the day. There's only so much attention. There's really only so much our system can digest. And if your fixation is with esoteric <laughs> sexual politics, like transgender bathrooms or, 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 or plastic straws warming, on Fox. I mean, I was just watching how, how long, how many well, no, no, but, shows on plastic straws are you going to have here on Fox? I mean, how, how uh, I don't, that's, that I mean, we, lives? We, we did one. We do a lot of segments on economics because I think it's really important. So like the elites I, I of your call party a core are economic only, issue, Tucker. Well, I would not. Issue. No. Yeah. Well, I'm not claiming it was. We do a lot of segments on core economic issues, including this one. But I'm just interested, like your elites never say anything about how inviting millions of poor people into the country every year might depress wages for the working class. Well, we're not, look, we're not talking about uh, uh inviting in millions of people. The truth of the matter is, is that we do have millions of people in this country living in the shadows who are working hard. Many of them, in fact, are paying taxes. Uh, their kids are in schools. They're contributing to our, our country. Uh, and I think we have to recognize that reality. That's for sure. Uh, but let's talk about the core economic issues. You wanted to talk about the quote unquote democratic socialism. I know uh, people on Fox love the scary labels and the red baiting, but let's talk about what that means. Uh, overwhelmingly well, hold on. No, wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. I'm, I'm actually giving you the fairest possible shake you would get on any I, channel ever. I'm taking your ideas seriously. I'm not mocking you. Sure. I just am wondering if your ideas aren't on a collision course with the agenda set by the elites in your party. And you know as well as I do, the answer is yes. They're incompatible. What well, you're look, saying is not compatible with what they're saying, and you know it. What, what, what I am saying is that we need a democratic party in this country and we need a government in this country that represents the needs of ordinary people and that includes an agenda uh, that guarantees health care to all people, uh, that pays people a living wage, that pays uh, equally whether you're a man or a woman, uh, that protects our environment, that gives people opportunity to go to college and to have a good life. That's what I'm talking about. People not retiring in poverty, uh, destroying Social Security. These are the things that uh, people are talking about in the progressive movement. Uh, and frankly, Tucker, if you look at the polling, it's wildly popular.
No, but they're not talking. But okay, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said. Uh, what, what you said that is not true at all is that that's what they're talking about. They're not. They're talking about race. They're talking about sex. They're talking about identity politics. They're attacking people because their skin color. I mean, I do this for a living. I know exactly what they're saying. Oh, okay. Well, let's and they're not, not talk saying about people what you attacking just people said. with their skin color because I think if we go right to the White House where that starts, frankly, my friend. Uh, oh, but let's, you know, let's the, be real. I mean, honestly, no, let, every time I talk to progressive, it's like, oh, white man, this. It's like, what does that have to do with empowering the average person economically, which well, is we what a, the agenda got, ought to have, be. We have got to empower people of all races in this country, frankly. Uh, exactly. And, and, we, and, you know, you cannot ignore the intersection of race and gender and other things. I mean, you're a smart guy. I'm not on Hannity here. This is a real show. And, uh, you know, you can't oh, ignore please. those. You, you can't ignore those issues. Uh, but uh, you are right. I'm not we ignoring do have to, the issues, but, no, no, but I the children you. in your party I who are clearly one. in charge are all about... I mean, do you think, do you personally, as a pretty serious guy, I guess a serious guy, get a little tired of having to follow like inflamed upper middle class college students who are constantly yelping about identity politics? Don't you think that's kind of a distraction from like the adult issues or no? Well, no, I, I think you're creating a false dichotomy here. Uh, there are uh, important no, issues that are both issues of identity and there are important issues of economics. And I think we have to speak to both. Uh, and people in the Democratic Party who advocate just one or the other, I'm constantly in conflict with those people who think that we only have to talk about one side of this, you know, uh, two-sided coin. We have to talk about these important issues that affect marginalized communities and we have to talk about laying out an economic agenda that is going to uplift people of all races and every zip code in this country. Uh, that's the mission in front of us. And if you look at Bernie Sanders' historic campaign in 2016. He won overwhelmingly won independent voters uh, in the Democratic primary uh, process, including in places yep. that were very, very red, uh, because uh, folks understood that he was standing with their families uh, in their everyday struggles. And that's what we I'm, as Democrats I'm actually, and progressives I'm, have to I'm do. actually kind of, I'm kind of aware of that. I just think, I, here's where I disagree with you, and we got to go, but I would just say in one sure, sentence, I think the identity politics people are beating you. And I, and I hope I'm wrong. Well, um, I, I think anyway, with uh, Jeff, people you. like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, we're winning. <laughs> I think she's on the identity politics side. Uh, but come uh, back. Uh, we well, can you talk are, about you it. Sorry, we're out of time. Jeff Weaver, thank you. In an exclusive investigation by this program, we warned you about the war on standards underway at the FAA. In the name of diversity, federal officials devalued a skills-based test for hiring, oh, no big deal, air traffic controllers and instead implemented a biographical questionnaire whose purpose was not hiring skilled controllers. In fact, the more skills you had, the fewer points you got, perversely, but instead the point was ensuring the hiring of people who were of the right race. It was insane, of course, dangerous, yes, and it sparked a major reaction. Now the Department of Transportation says it is ready to revise those policies in the name of public safety. Stephen Bradbury is the general counsel of the Department of Transportation, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Bradbury, thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me on, Tucker. So I, it's, it was a pretty simple uh, story, and I think the fix is pretty simple. Can you assure our viewers that air traffic controllers will be hired solely on the basis of relevant criteria? In other words, how good they are at air traffic controlling, and not on the basis of irrelevant criteria like their appearance? That's right. We're making a change to no longer use that biographical assessment that the FAA has used since t 2014 and that you featured on your show. I, I will point out that the version you focused on with the questions that you highlighted, which I agree are counterintuitive at best, was used in, for Demented, one year. Yeah. For one year in 2014. Changes were made and uh, a new assessment was used after 2014 with different questions and it didn't have those questions that you had focused on. Nevertheless, in 2016, Congress prohibited the FAA from using the biographical assessment to screen applicants, mo more than half the applicants, for entry-level positions as trainees for the for air traffic control. Okay, but hold control. on, hold and, on. Before we get oh, so, so so hold on, wait, wait, hold on. I'm sorry, you're getting the weeds here a bit, and I think it's sort of a red herring. The question is not whether or not a biographical questionnaire is used. The question is solely, is the hiring done exclusively on the basis of skills-based criteria, relevant criteria? Does a person's appearance, sexual orientation, parents' background, does that play any role in hiring at all? At no. all. No, because it if doesn't. it does, and that's dangerous. It, no, it, at all. It, it doesn't, and we agree with you that for hiring of trainees for the academy to be trained as air traffic controllers, 
you really should focus exclusively on aptitude, competence, for being an excellent air traffic controller. And so we're making, we're clearing the decks, and what we're doing and what I'm announcing on your show tonight is that the FAA is no longer going to use the biographical assessment in any form, and instead is going to give all applicants for these entry-level positions the aptitude test, which is the air traffic skills assessment test, which just tests for aptitude for the characteristics of being an excellent air traffic controller. And that test is validated, Amen. it's been standardized, it's proctored test, and it's the same test that applicants take who are graduates of the collegiate training initiative schools and who apply for the academy to be air traffic control trainees. And, and I think it's important, Tucker, to point out that what we're talking about is the incoming candidates for the academy where they get trained like a boot camp for air traffic control duties. These are not right. people who are hired and put on the job in control towers to be air traffic controllers. They I have understand. To, they have to go through very rigorous training at the academy and many of them wash out. Sometimes more than half okay. wash out. It's okay. rigorous. They also well, go, for our purposes, say, we, they go we, through okay. two to three years, two to three years of on-the-job training as well before they can be certified as professional air traffic controllers. Okay. Okay. So I think yeah, but look, the, the bottom out. line is, hold on, wait, I'm sorry. Before we did the segment, this was still going on. So, I mean, before you take too much credit, I'm glad you made the change. But well, this was still a, a going on a change until we made. shined the light on it. A well, yeah, okay. listen, I do give you an assist for helping us focus on this issue. And, <laughs> yeah, helping uh, you focus on it. All right. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you did. But, I mean, I just want to be clear about that. Uh, I think you, you needed some light shine on this. So, Stephen, thank you very I, much. I will. I, appreciate I will. It. I, I will.